Hey, I wanted to tell you about something that you're going to see in your email inbox here in the next few days, and we will put a link to this in the a description of today's podcast. But we are giving you a chance to give us some feedback about uh, the podcast. We want to know um, how we can better meet your needs, the things that you're looking for, uh, the things that you want from this podcast. When you listen or when you watch, what are you after? And so there's a link to a survey uh, in the comment section or in the description here of this podcast. You also get one in your email inbox. We would like to hear from you to tell us a little bit about what you think, how often you listen, what are you listening for, and how we can make this better. Please give us that feedback. And we'll do our best to shape this into the exact tool that you need to help improve your walk with Christ. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of One Single Story, where each weekday we offer a brief lesson from a section of today's reading. Then we examine a single relevant question that passage points us to. Today, I'm joined by Wendy Korpacheski, and we are looking at a passage from Psalm 84. So this song expresses a desire to be in God's dwelling place, the the temple. And there are other psalms that speak of, you know, longing for the temple. But in many of those poems, the issue seems to be about being prevented from going to the temple. Um, this would have been particularly been the case during times of exile. They, they weren't able to. Psalm 84 does not have the issue of not being allowed to go to the temple. The tension here of the psalm is expressed that the author is unable to stay at the temple all the time. It seems he regrets um, having to leave God's presence and return to his daily routine. Um, this poem seems to match the uh, theme of the pilgrimage psalms. You, you, psalms uh, uh, 120 to 134 are called pilgrimage psalms. And um, it is distinct enough in content that it is, it's not grouped with them. But Psalm 84 in the temple, the psalmist finds joy and strength, verses 5 through 7. He finds hope in verse 6. He finds grace and glory in verse 11, good things in verse 11. And uh, the poem uses this metaphorical imagery to describe the safety and security that the worshiper finds in God's presence. So in verse 3, it says, Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at a place near your altar. O Lord of heaven's armies, my God and my King. We are not certain like exactly which kind of bird the author has in mind translation possibilities uh, it says the sparrow but it could be a swallow a pigeon or a sparrow all of these birds are defenseless um, their safety is found in being able to escape to a place uh, in flight and nest in a, in a safe place and the psalmist pictures himself as this defenseless defenseless bird uh, he finds safety in the presence of god but ironically, the bird is portrayed as nesting near the altars of the temple, and the, the altar is a place where these kind of birds would have been sacrificed. Uh, the reader is faced with this question, is it really a safe nest uh, for a bird? Um, safety for the believer is only found in the presence of God. But the thing we need to understand is that the, it's not the absence of trouble, nor the absence of sacrifice, or the absence of suffering. As a matter of fact, nesting in God's safety often requires embracing the altar of sacrifice. So, um, Wendy, let's talk about some of the tension here. Um, when we think of safety in God's presence, what what is it that we usually mean or we usually picture? I think it's you know, all all the things like you know safety from the attacks of the enemy, provision, comfort, peace. You know, um, any of those things that you you would you would kind of think would define safety, you know, all of the comfort things that God could afford. How do you think modern Christians define that? I mean, how do they see, do they think safety and sacrifice coexist? Like, can you have both? Can you be safe and sacrificial? I think the church has done a markedly better job in recent years of helping define that for believers. Um, I know early on in my walk, it was um, it was like if, if 
you make it a faith decision, you know, welcome to the family of God. If, you know, it's going to be wonderful. You're going to be in this loving relationship with fellow believers. God loves you. It's, you know, sunshine and roses. But in recent years, the realities of walking out your faith have been communicated much better. Mm-hmm. Like any time, and in fact, you you did it this past Sunday with the message. We just started this series on um self-control anytime you're doing something in alignment with god's will and god's purpose and acting with those fruits of the spirit you're simultaneously painting a target on your back um and so there's a there's a balance there um and so the reality of walking out your faith and what that looks like I think is is becoming um, the the picture of what that looks like. The church has done a much better job of of um, communicating that. Yeah, and I think we say things that we mean well, and we may mean more than what we're saying. But when somebody's life is falling apart, well, what you really need is Jesus. Well, the answer to that is yes. What you really need is Jesus, but. It doesn't mean it's going to be easier, right? Right. You're, you're going to have a different set of problems, but you're going to have help, right? That's the hope. Mm-hmm. You're going to be able to have help or or somebody to sustain you or, or that safety. You know, it, it's, it's, it is really hard to explain to people, but occasionally I'll hear people say something, that loss of a loved one, they go through some tragedy. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know how people make it without the Lord, right? That, they'll say that. that that'll that be a common phrase. And what they're trying to say is, I don't know what I would do if I didn't know I had ultimate protection, you know, right. because this is difficult. And even when it comes to salvation, I believe there are some things that you will only face until after you get saved, right? Because he don't care. Right. If if you don't pose a threat, he's not. He's leaving you alone. Right. If you're already walking in the flesh, he don't need to give you more flesh. Right. Right. <laughs> he might ultimately want to destroy you, but the minute that you start new life, right, he's going to come after you. And so, and, and and it's not just difficulty. Following after Christ is a sacrificial life. Mm-hmm. It's a sacrifice of time. You know, we we've talked about it in in. Um leadership groups right the the everybody in the world is busy right now mm-hmm. the question is what are your priorities right where where right. what how are you ordering those things you know mm-hmm. so what things are getting left out and what i find is that we do the things that fulfill us you know that we think make, make us happy instead of the things that are spiritual because always the things that are spiritual are not easy sometimes they are sacrificial absolutely and it's that differentiation between what brings me happiness and what will bring me joy mm-hmm. and it, it's nuanced it's it, there's there's that that fine line and that that idea that to be walking in what you, you were had referred to is that that hope like how can people do this without the lord it, it's not that there's an absence of sting or an absence of pain it's just there's that underlying current that because of the things that I'm doing, the sacrifices that I'm making now, I have, you know, credited my account right. with this hope that I get to cash in right. ultimately. Or, just, or that I'm going to have to, you know, there are things that are, 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 are intentionally finances, you know, mm-hmm. um, would it be easier not to give 10%? or more to the church the answer sure. to that sure it would i mean 100 percent. it would be easier um would it be easier to be gone on the weekends than to you know be present with and connect with god's people and worship together be refreshed be encouraged sure most of the time it would be i mean there the list is long you know um somebody who's in need you got to give your time to them you know you got to 
constantly answer messages or emails or whatever, you know, texts from, and that seemed to be the same thing over and over and over again. But sometimes maybe that's where God's called you and the person that God's called you to. Sometimes it is sacrificial. And um, I think we have to, that, that concept of safety and sacrifice going together. Um, maybe even s- suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I mean, because when you think about that picture, that bird was close to other birds that were... Getting plucked up to have their heads yeah, wrung off. That's right, to be a sacrifice. Right. And they could be next, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that picture of, okay, I'm willing to suffer... Because I, my safety ultimately is in him is mm-hmm. critical to all mm-hmm. of us. And it's a sacrifice until, and this is going to sound weird, it's a sacrifice until it's not. Like Given like the 10% of your time, of your week's time, to come and sit in a worship service, because really that's what it is. It's a tithe of your time to sit in that worship service is a sacrifice until the day that that worship service changes your life Mm -hmm. until god speaks to you through that message that something impactful happens and so for me you know in in my mind is then it becomes like all of those times where i felt like it, it might have been a sacrifice it get it all gets canceled out right because his presence is worth it worth it all yeah you know I, I, an example would would be um we had a fifth event sunday recently mm-hmm. and um for whatever reason that morning before i ever got to church i was already tired which is unusual usually sundays energize mm-hmm. me but i was i was tired when i walked in the building for some reason And I knew, like, I'm going to have to be here this afternoon to 2 or 3 o'clock. And it was hot as blazes. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, so you you do it, you know. And we had a a debrief after it was over with. I had some questions just in general about, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? How are we trying to accomplish it? You know, those kind of things. But anyway, um, the very next Sunday, which would have been the Sunday before we're recording this, uh, a lady and her two daughters come to church. And w- the reason why she was there is because her daughter, the previous Sunday, had been invited to come to the um, fun family day after church. And she told her mom, I want to come back. I want you to come back. I want you to come with me. So her mom came the next week. And her mom gave her life to Jesus the next week. Right? Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think about, you know, um, all of the trouble that event could have been and, and as exhausted as I was trying to go out there and, mm-hmm. you know, cause you gotta, you have, there is no such thing as not being on. Like you gotta be on, right? you, you just have to be on. And, um, and, you know, asking questions about, you know, why, why do we do this? You know, I would rather be taking a nap. Can I go home and watch a football mm-hmm. game? But that one thing, right, makes it all worthwhile. All of it, yeah. And uh, every dollar, every hour planning, every volunteer hour spent out there, right? All the resources. If that, that was the only thing that come out of it, it it's was worth, worth it. It, it was mm-hmm. worth it all. And you know, everything doesn't get calculated that way. I just, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it doesn't. But sometimes the things that are the most sacrificial or the most treasury produce results that we had we didn't expect. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for joining us today on this edition of One Single Story. We hope you'll be back with us tomorrow as we continue a conversation around the book of Psalms.